Okay, so we had been doing the um, the block and the ink line. So we've made it through this chunk. We've made it through the threaded fastener. This video is going to concentrate on the wheel and axle friction. What this is talking about here. Okay, so we have some kind of an axle and then a second solid piece that's rotating around the axle. And what I want you to imagine here is that this inside part, the axle, is not completely snug with the wheel that's around it. So there's there's a gap in there somehow. And depending on how that weight is distributed, so whether the outside part is holding up the inside or the inside part is holding up the outside, the friction isn't gonna happen along the entire edge of it. It's gonna just be one point. So if I'm holding the outside and the inside is rotating, it's going to actually kind of slide up on the side of that thing. And there's going to be one point where all of that contact and friction happens versus if I'm holding the inside and the outside is kind of resting on the inside, that contact point is going to be on the top of it. And depending on if it's kind of leaning to the left or leaning to the right is where that contact is going to happen. So let's go ahead and, and think through how we can define that. And this is going to involve a moment. So we're rotating the outside or we're rotating the inside and it's kind of rotating up the side inside of the thing to, to contact it. Okay, so we'll start out with the wheel and axle. The axle is going to have a weight acting straight down at the middle of it. And let's say this axle is attached to a motor and we turn the motor on. So this inside part starts rotating and it's going to climb up the wall as it rotates. And we're going to be interested in this spot where it's contacting the wall. Thinking through the forces at this contact. So the friction force is going to be tangent to the circle here. We also have a normal force. And this friction and normal force will add together to a vertical resultant. Weight is acting straight down. The resultant is acting straight up. And again, we see this friction angle coming into play. So UN over N, this angle is defined by our friction coefficient. Now, as the motor is trying to turn this clockwise, of course, friction is going to fight that and want to go counterclockwise. So the moment created around the center point. So if we take the moment around this black center point, we have the distance from the center to where this resultant is acting. And this is going to be the pair, this R cross F, that we're interested in because that's, that's going to keep this motor from being efficient. And what we do is we're going to describe this with what's called a friction radius. So this very light blue circle that kind of intersects the line of action of this resultant force, this is called the friction radius. And it's, it's kind of related to where this friction coefficient is. Okay, let's think about this friction radius. So drawing this thing in from the center to the line of action of the force. So that's one radius. We also are probably going to know the axle radius. So put these guys into a right-hand triangle. Let me just draw this off to the left here. So here's this blue triangle with a friction radius and the axle radius. And we can go ahead and relate those through the angle. Let's just call it theta. Okay, so if we say sine of theta is that ratio opposite over adjacent friction radius over axle radius. For our friction force over here, so all of these red arrows. So again, we have the resultant, it's a combination of un and n, and there's an angle over here too, that tangent of theta. So that's our un over n, or u. Now those two angles are adjacent to one another. 
See how those are pretty much the same thing? If you look at similar triangles, especially if this is going to be a smaller angle, then those two especially look like one another. And what that tells us is sine theta is essentially equal to tangent theta, or the ratio of the friction radius over r is essentially the, the ratio of the other legs of the triangle. And um, I'll show you this relationship here in a bit, but you really can make this approximation so that your friction radius is some fraction of the axle radius, and that fraction ends up being the friction coefficient. Here is showing that just that opposite over hypotenuse versus opposite over adjacent so consider a really skinny triangle. This works especially well for small angles. The adjacent side and the hypothesis, they're pretty much the same thing. So that sine theta is approximately equal to tangent theta. And you can, I plugged it into this table here so you can actually see the difference. And all the way up to like 25 degrees, I mean, there's, it's pretty, it's pretty close to one another if you plug these in. So again, when we hop, hop back here and compare this friction angle to the angle defining the friction radius, these two guys really are very, very similar to one another. So, so this equation holds fairly well, and I, this, it shouldn't ride up the edge that much. If you think about un versus n, this is some fraction of the normal force. So this is always going to be less than 45 degrees because you don't have friction that's larger than one, unless I guess you have a dehesion, but that's a whole different thing. So we're, we're dealing with just dry friction here, and it should be a very small angle, actually, that it rides up the side here. Okay, so here's three different scenarios we can think through. Um, so this is what we just put there where r sine theta theta that looks like the friction coefficient so we have the big r big r is the combination of the friction and normal force so that's that force going straight up is the big r and that's going to be equal to some fraction of the axle radius and that fraction is our kinetic friction coefficient for this thing sliding around now, just like we made equivalent systems before, we can do the same thing here, where instead of drawing the system as a reaction, and the reaction is at the friction radius, we can just call it a moment. So the friction acts like a moment that is resisting the rotation of the motor. So we have the motor trying to go one way, and then the friction is acts like a moment going the opposite direction, and we have that weight force going straight down, and the reaction going straight up. But for a lot of these, we're going to be defining this friction radius. And if we know the friction coefficient and the weight, then we can chug through this and, and calculate what that moment is going to be. So here is an example problem with one of these. So what we have is we have a lever arm. So like a balance beam or something, right? So we have a weight on one side and some force on the other side. And this is going to be an R cross F situation, right? So some distance to this 40 kilograms, some distance to the force over here. And this lever arm is pivoting around an axle in the center. So there's, there's actually two solid pieces here. There's what's happening on the center piece versus this outside piece. So we'll go ahead and we'll draw a free body diagram of just this the lever arm, ignoring the axle in here. And then we'll think about where in on the inside of this lever arm that friction force is going to hit. OK, so it's loosely fitted. And for all of these, think about it loosely fitted. That's how you're going to you know, visualize it creeping up on the side. And we have some some dimensions here. So here's the radius of our axle is 30 millimeters. And we know a force of 275 is going to just start the lever rotating clockwise. OK, let's start drawing some of this stuff in. So 275 
that is just going to start the lever rotating clockwise. Okay, so can you visualize where on here is the contact going to happen? So we have the axle, and we know there's going to be some sort of a friction radius on here. The weight is, is pulling down, and as it rolls around, can you imagine the axle kind of rolling over here so that that impact point is going to sort of happen over here on this right-hand side as it turns clockwise? So if we drew the forces acting on here, the reaction, and remember this is going to be some combination of the friction force and the normal force, but we're just going to add those two, two together to an overall reaction. That's what it's going to be pivoting around. So if you think of this as like a, um, as, as like a teeter-totter or something, right? So we have a force on one side, a force on the other side, and then it's balancing around something. It's not balancing around the center of that axle. It's balancing somewhere kind of to the right of that center. And the, the difference between those two guys, that's going to be our, our friction radius, where our friction radius is going to be some fraction of our axle radius, and that's that's going to be our, our 30 millimeters, so some fraction of that. Okay, so what we can do is we can take the moment around this point. Okay, so let's say the point that it's actually balancing around is, let's, we can call this point D, and if we go from D over to one side versus D over to the other side, we just have to adjust these dimensions by that friction radius, right? So we're, we're popping it over a little bit, which means that the 160 is smaller and the 100 is larger. So we're, we're increasing the 100 side and then we're decreasing that 160 side because of where it's, it's actually balancing around. And if you rearrange this, then you can figure out what the friction radius is. And once you have the friction radius, you can figure out what your, your friction coefficient was. OK, so this is rotating clockwise. Let's read part B here. Part B is the smallest force. So if, if instead of 275, it's going to be a small force instead. And the edge on the small force is it's going to maybe start rotating the opposite direction. OK, so let's, let me pull up the next slide to think about the next scenario. So this will be, what is the smallest force, p min, that it does not start rotating? So this is right on the edge of that static friction. And this time, it's going to be rotating the opposite direction. So P is just really teeny, just barely holding on. So now it's going to rotate counterclockwise, and this 40 kilogram is really pulling on it. So in this case, now it's, it's rolling over to the other side so that that reaction is now over here. OK, does that make sense? So we've got. We've got things in a, in a little bit different spot here. It's still the same friction radius. It's the same friction coefficient that we got from A. It's just rolled over onto the other side. And so now we're going to add the friction radius to the 160. So it's 160 plus the friction radius, and then 100 minus the friction radius. So as long as you can just find what spot this thing is, is actually contacting and then do some moment calculations around it, that's what all of these problems boil down to. You have to just really think about how it's rolling around in there, 
where the contact point is, figure out your friction radius, and then chug through some moment calculations on that.